Welcome to the Seahawks Man to Man podcast, powered by The Athletic. Shout out to the company. My name is Michael Sean Dugar. I'm here with my co-host, Christopher Kidd. Make sure you follow us both up on the Tweet Machine. You guys already know the drill with the Tweet Machine, so I'm going to just plug the YouTube channel, Seahawks Man to Man on YouTube. Shout out to our Spotify listeners, Apple, The Athletic. That's fine. We rock with y'all. Slide over to YouTube real fast. Just hit subscribe and then come right back. That's all we need. Uh, Chris, talk to him. What is up, everybody? It's your boy Christopher Kidd. Be sure to follow me on Twitter at C K I D D two zero six, and that's C Kid two zero six. All right, our YouTube listeners or YouTube viewers can see that I am in a poorly lit uh, hotel room uh, in downtown Houston after the Seahawks have uh, defeated the very bad Houston Texans, um, thirty three to thirteen. It was a beatdown. Uh, they won by three touchdowns. That's how the Seahawks should treat a bad team. It kind of reminds me how they treated the Jets last year, like a bad team. Um, smoked them by like 30 or whatever. Um, and that's what you should do, just like they smoked the Jaguars. Um, a very complete win. Uh, special teams pretty solid, you know, outside of some missed PATs. Ran the ball well, threw the ball well, protected well, defense stopped the run, got the hands on passes. Just like what you expect from a team that like there was so few Texans fans there, like that it felt like a Seahawk home game. Like that's what it really felt at NRG Stadium, man. It was, it was, it was, it was bad for the Texans. I feel bad uh, for them Texans fans. Thankfully, like one of their teams good. Is the baseball team good here? Yeah, the Astros. You're asking me. Oh, that's right. Chris don't watch some freaking <laughs> baseball. I don't know what I'm thinking asking you about baseball. That's my bad. That's my. I think the Astros. Astros are good. Rockets are bad. And then uh, now the strip the clubs Texans. are great. Uh, yeah, strip clubs are always going to be great in Texas. But that's a whole <laughs> nother podcast. Uh, but I. I uh, I'm sure people watch the game and think, well, Mike, well, Chris, we beat the Texans. <laughs> the Texans are bad. So, of course, we're going to look good against them. Russ is going to look like Russ. Tyler's going to look like Tyler. Hell, Rashad Penny looked like, you know, Jim Brown. Yeah, <laughs> you know, <laughs> against. Oh, <laughs> shoot. That was good. So, that's how bad the Texans are. The Texans have a, they're 2 and 10 going into this game. Uh, they had a, a first-year head coach who's actually never been a head coach uh, either. It's an important distinction there. So he's never been a head coach in the NFL. Uh, they have a, have a rookie quarterback. Their roster is trash um, about every position possible. Their fans don't even show up to the games anymore. Like, it's 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 pretty bad. So uh, And they're super banged up, too. So, like, there's a lot of reasons to believe that they were going to, like, smoke these guys in that way. But I want to talk about something here, Chris. Real fast, because the noise is starting and you can hear it. And by the noise, I mean just to talk about the future. And some of that has been us. You know, we, I perpetuated that. I, be, I tweet the Russ Pete era is over because I don't really think it's going to continue. But like I haven't like put out no reports or anything, no anonymous source stuff like I could do. I'm not going to yet, uh, but I could. But everybody else is. You can kind of hear Peter King. Um, he was on like the Rich Eisen show. So like, yeah, change is coming. You know, Mike Garofolo, we talked about that last week. The Jody Allen report that she's beefing. This week it was, um, what's my man's name? Uh, Dan Rappaport. No, they had the report with the team. Jordan Schultz. Jordan Schultz, Jordan yeah, Schultz okay. had the report that Russ will waive. He'll strongly consider waiving his no trade clause for the Broncos, the Giants, or the Saints. And then Russ has to shoot it down. But then what does that create? Like that creates a whole nother topic of discussion that had nothing to do with the Texans. Right? Well, now we're talking about Russ and his future in week heading into week 14. And then what does Ian Rappaport have the morning of the game? Oh, he he says he got a source to basically confirm Jordan's report. At least that's what I thought he wrote because Ian's piece was very sloppy and very confusing. And I didn't really know what he was trying to say. But I read it as I can confirm what Jordan's talking about, that Russ will waive his no trade clause for the Broncos, um, Giants, and the Saints, or or the Saints. So it's already starting. Now is week 14. 
So if they had lost, basically they're at the point where they have what, like a 5% chance of winning uh, right now. We're recording before the Sunday night game with the bears is over and, uh, and the Packers, like they're still going. So we don't know how the odds will change with that game. The Niners won. Um, this, and then the Cardinals and Rams play on Monday night. So their odds can fluctuate, but it's a percentage point here or there. Point is it's like five, three, anywhere from three to 6%. That's not great, right? That's not great. They're basically at the point the Seahawks are where if you lose another game, now we can't, we can't even be delusional with you. We can't focus on the team in front of you. We don't want to, like you lose this game. We don't want to ask you about the Rams. Now we're asking DK about whether he wants to get an extension. We're asking Quandre whether he wants to resign. We're asking Brent, Dwayne Brown whether he thinks he can play longer. We're asking DJ Reed if he wants a new contract. We're asking Brandon Show the same thing. Rashad Penny the same thing. Alex Collins the same thing. We're asking about the draft. We're all doing mock drafts in December. We have to move on if they lose again. And I was ready to move on after the Cardinals lost, but um, because they're mathematically still in it, we had to do that. And then by moving on, we have to talk about John Snyder's future and Pete Carroll's future and Russell Wilson's future. And all that was going to do was get noisier and noisier and noisier. And it was going to be everywhere. Me and you go, they're going to be like, Hey, Mike, Chris, they're going to keep Russ. They're going to keep Pete. They're going to keep John. I know you get it wherever you go. I know I get it wherever I go to barbershop. You know, I go to get some food. I go to the family's house, you know, a grandma, you know, uncle, you, you know, mom and dad. Hey, uh, uh, son, what do you think? Uh, keep Russell? I don't know. <laughs> you know, it was going to keep getting louder and louder and louder. And it was going to get national. And next thing you know, it was going to be like a Colin Cowherd monologue and a Jason Lock and Forward report. And then another Peter King thing. And Seth Wickersham jumps in somewhere probably at some point. It was just going to get ugly. And that may still happen. But you know what they bought today by smoking the Texans? Seven more days of not having that happen. And that's really important because I think I talked about, I forget which game it was, where I was just like, the biggest thing today is like they're still playing for each other. And you look around the league and there are some teams that are just not. <laughs> the Jags are not playing for Urban Meyer. <laughs> nope. They have given up on that, man. He called them losers. Yeah. Hey, man, I don't know if Urban Meyer just don't got Wi-Fi or he don't know how things go. But I think he should look at his record as head coach of the Jaguars and realize, brother, you are a loser too. Yeah. <laughs> you got to losing, you're losing just right with us. They ain't score no points. And that's a team that's not playing for his coach. The Seahawks are still playing for their coach and playing for each other. But you can only do that for so long when you're not winning. And you can only do that but for so long if your most important player, your quarterback, got these rumors out here like, hey man. Your agent's talking about you want to get traded to these teams, and there's this report you want to go to this team, and this is other reports coming out. Like once that starts getting noisy, the locker room is gonna fall apart. It won't now for at least another seven days. That's what they got, Chris. Seven days, like the Craig. What's the uh, is it Craig David? I think uh, you know what I'm talking about the met the girl yeah. on Monday. Yep. Take a fuck a drink on Tuesday. Yeah, I'm not gonna sing on the pod, but yeah, <laughs> I think that's Craig David. I've like, met too many times. They, 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 yeah, you sing a lot on the on the pod, like and on the radio. Do, <laughs> you sing on the radio too. You remember we were doing the episode? Uh, what was it? A few months ago, and I started singing, and you're like, "Oh yeah, don't don't do that no more." <laughs> yeah, you you're comfortable. Like you can you sing on the radio. You'll do impressions on the radio. Like I'm not really comfortable with my <laughs> my vocal range to do that. I just kind of do do my thing. Other than that, Craig David song, which is is called Seven Days. But yeah, that's what they bought. Seahawks bought themselves a good old Craig David, you know, it's, it's seven days. And I, and I think that that's, we can, we'll talk about the game here in a second, but that is a really important, like we got to keep that in mind here that we're talking about dudes and their futures and guys were upset last year when Russ is like, yo, trade, trade. What you mean? I, I resigned because of you fool, <laughs> you know, like Chris Carson, like, yo, I came back to play with you, you know, and Carlos yeah. Dunlap, like I resigned to play with you. You know, Tyler yeah. Lock, like, I signed an extension to play with you. What's up with this? You, you know, like, what you mean trade and you want to go to the Cowboys or the Bears? What's up with that? You know, Dwayne Brown, what you mean you frustrated getting hit? Stay your ass in the pocket then. Mm. <laughs> you know, like, or get rid of the ball. You know, like, I, Dwayne didn't say those things, but you know what I mean. Like, Dwayne admitted, yeah. like, yeah, I, Dwayne was like, yeah, I saw what he said, and I called him. <laughs> you know, like, that's, and, and that's only going to get worse. If if you if Russ lets these rumors kind of build up, and you can tell like it's what stuff is coming from his people, so they won today to quiet the noise. They had to quiet that noise because it was gonna get it was gonna get bad, especially if they lose to the Texans. If they lost to this, like if they lose next week, it'll be bad. But it's like the Rams might win the Super Bowl. Yeah, they're you that know? good. And, 
and that's on the road against a division opponent and a coach that's whooped your coach's ass since 2017. If you'd have lost to this team, this Texas team, it's like, all right, somebody's not getting on the plane to Texas. Like, they, they can come back home to Renton, but they got to take the bus. They can't fly with us if you lose to, to the Texans. And now they, they got to avoid that. And I think just for the state of the locker room, while you're still trying to get guys to buy in, whether they're trying to buy, you want them to long-term buy into Russ or buy into Pete or buy into John or some combination of those three individuals, like you have to win these type of games this way. Otherwise, it's, oh, this report, this guy's lost the locker room. Oh, this infighting, just like the Jags. Look at the Jags right now. Then Marvin Jones, he got into it with Urban. Is that what it was? Yeah, there was like some infighting going on there. You got to avoid being the Jaguars. How do you avoid being the Jaguars? Beat the Texans. And I thought that was like, aside from some of the like things that happened on the field specifically, that was my biggest like takeaway is they were able to delay – you know, me and my coworkers having to have a Google Doc ready to go about Pete getting fired or Russ getting traded or something like that. Now I can put that Google Doc away for seven or for seven days. They lose next week. I maybe mean, I'm back opening up on Monday. But for now, that's that. That's huge because it's hard to get people to pay attention to the unfilled product when everyone's focused on what's going to happen next. You know, that, that's, yeah, that's that, really. Yeah, and that's why last week I was saying they're literally taking this week by week. They beat the Niners yeah. last week. Okay, cool. It was, like you said, quieting the noise. Like, all the stuff, the rumors were coming out. Everything is getting noisy, especially after a loss. But when you get that win, it just puts a little calm with the team. They're believing. They believe they can win out. That's their goal right now, but they take it week by week because that's what it is right now. You have no room for error at this point. You've put yourself in a position where you have to win out and you don't want these rumors spreading because, as we talked about last week, these guys are playing for themselves. They're playing for Pete. They're playing for the contracts. They're playing because, you know, we want Russ back. There, There's all these intangibles with this team, and they beat a really bad tex Texans team, which they really should have. Really bad Texans team. Very bad. 2-10, <laughs> and 10, now 2-11. and 11. This was a win that they needed to build on from. You said you didn't have much stuff on field that you really want to hit on because it was, you know – they played the Texans, but I think one positive thing is the third downs. Mm -hmm. They executed. Sure. While it was against the Texans, they were able to run the ball in certain situations, throw the ball, play action. You saw it, mm -hmm. and that is something Lots they can build. Of play action. Yep. That, that, that's something they can build off of, and hopefully when they go up against the Rams, they have that confidence that, you know, I, of course we did it with against a bad team, but it's still the NFL. Anything can happen. If we go out and execute and play our game, we can walk out and win that against a good NFC division rival in the Rams. But it, we talked about it off wax last week when I sent you the clip. The first play of the game, <laughs> and I don't know how many people caught this, the first play of the game, the Seahawks called the screen. Now, after rewatching the game. You know about the Niners game? Excuse me, yeah, the Niners game. After rewatching the tape, the first play of the game, they run the screen. The reason why it doesn't work is because Will Disley and Freddie Swain blocked the cornerback. So if you he look at the, the game, guy, yeah. block the same guy that blocked the corner. So I text you, I was like, yo. <laughs> This is a problem. And you're like, yeah, Freddie Swain got to be better at blocking, but D. Eskridge might be better. And funny, on one of Rashad Penny's touchdowns today, guess who was out there lead blocking? D. Yeah, Eskridge. Yeah, yeah. You were right on the money with that. So that was a great call there because D. Eskridge, I, I hadn't seen enough of him to realize that he's a good pass blocker. I'm trying to see him get the ball in other situations, which I think he can provide scoring. But I get it if he's good at – Run blocking, you can throw him out there as well because we did see that. So kudos to D. Eskridge. He didn't get the ball. He did get an opportunity, but dropped it, which was a fumble because it's behind the line of scrimmage. Glad that didn't turn into an ugly play. But overall, I thought the offense had its ups and downs, but they played well. Rush did not get sacked. So kudos so to that. First time it since. When was the last time Russ didn't get played a game? You, you said it last it. week. It was last year sometime. But was it? I forget which game. It was like. My eh. guess would be the Washington game. That would be my guess. I think – I don't remember. Yeah, I just yeah, know it was last season. Go ahead. I'm, I'm going to look it up. But go ahead. I do know it was last season, but that was some positive things that I saw. Unfortunately, the pass rush is still non-existent outside of Daryl Taylor. Al Woods. And, <laughs> Al Woods is a problem, a really big problem. My man is a force. The Picking him up was a, was a huge deal. The Seahawks, if they didn't have Al Woods – 
I don't know how much worse this defense could be. I really don't. Yeah, very bad. It would be a very bad run defense in particular if they didn't. That's true. Yeah, now he's 6'4, 330 pounds, man. That's a, and he, and he's, he, he's athletic. Yeah. Right. We talked about it off wax the play where he almost causes a safety, swims through, and he's right there. I mean, luckily, Rex Burkhart, Burkhead makes, makes a miss, but he gets cleaned up. And that's because of what Al Woods brings. If the Seahawks can bring him back for another season, kudos to them because he's definitely someone that can clog up the, the middle of the field and he gets his hands up when he gets after the quarterback but I'm waiting for this pass rush to get going I at this point I guess it's just Daryl Taylor and hopefully they can blitz some guys and get pressure but against Davis David is it Davis or David Mills I forget his it's name Davis. I, was, I had to look that up this week it's Davis Mills Davis. Davis. so yeah yeah I was really expecting the defensive line to really get after this guy and make it miserable for him you know Quandra gets an p- interception that's the type of day I was expecting they didn't get to the quarterback but they also shut down the run which made him one-dimensional and he wasn't really throwing pass he was just dunking it down I think what in the second half it was literally over and over he kept giving the ball to Freeman their backup running back because Rex ended up getting hurt earlier sometime in the game but for the most yeah, part his thought- average depth of target like to quantify what you're saying his average depth of target so the like distance from his yep. receiver from the line of scrimmage was about five and a half yards which is trash by yeah. comparison russ's today was 12.8 yards which means he was airing it out like, like that's probably yards. one of the highest marks you'll see in an individual game is like 12.8 uh and yeah uh davis was more than less than half to, or you know what i mean like cut that yeah. in half and then some so like yeah he was dinking and dunking and not moving it whereas russ was letting it fly and completing it at a better at a, at a good clip too so like russ was like everything davis would want to be not. russ was cooking with that i was really disappointed in the passers because i thought they could make it just miserable for this guy rookie out there he only has one guy to throw to that's brandon cooks he still had over 100 yards but that's because they were forcing him the ball screen plays he got open a couple of times, but for the most part, I thought Sidney Jones did okay. He had a few, okay, got a little nervous there on my end, but I thought overall he played decent. Hopefully DJ Reed's okay. He got banged up. But overall, from a game standpoint, I thought they they put together a good game plan and they executed for the most part. I just wish they can get after the quarterback. Hopefully, like I'm going a little ahead here. Against Detroit, I'm hoping they just go brazy on Jared Goff. I mean, three to four sacks. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry that I'm using it as a scapegoat for the Seahawks pass rush, but they need something. They don't have any kickstart. Like to Sunday's game against the Texans wasn't a kickstart for the pass rush. It was a kickstart for the entire defense that continues to play well in the second half of this season, but they still have one deficient issue, or one issue, excuse me, and that's the pass rush, not being able to put pressure on your court on the quarterback. Hopefully that changes. And they can create that because that'll take pressure off the DBs, <laughs> just a little bit, just a little bit. But those, that's no, kind of the end game stuff. They just can't and, do it. And you know what that does? Get into the quarterback, creating sacks, turnovers. That quiets the noise because likely the Seahawks win the game. I mean, there wasn't there wasn't even a turnover today by either team. Neither team turned it over. No. I'm Nobody looking at the pressure numbers right now. Yeah, no turnovers. Yeah. The Pete pressures probably weren't pissed. great. Let me see. Yeah. The Seahawks had 14 pressures, it looks like. Damn, Daryl's good. He had what, eight of them? No, nah, he he had three, but he had oh, three I'm guessing. 25 pass rush snaps, which is about, it's two, that's 12%. 12% is a really good pressure rate. Um, it's like for comparison, uh, Rasheem Green played 37 snaps as a pass rusher, so 12 more than Daryl, and only had two pressures. Because um, he had one with Al Woods, so yeah. um, that's a pressure rate of five point four. So that's the difference between twelve and five point four. So like that's huge a difference. yeah, huge, huge, huge drop there. Um, and yeah, and that also quiets the noise. Back to your point earlier, all that creates quieting the noise of probably the inevitable, <laughs> which is something being shaken up with the Seahawks organization. But uh, yeah, no, some shake. Oh, wow, Alvin Robinson continues. He, he actually led them in pressures with four. Um, on 28 pass rush snaps. Wow, that's really impressive. How bad was Carlos today? Because I know he only played a handful of snaps, and he only he was in coverage. I counted, ooh, I think three. I think twice today he was in coverage. I mean, I could tell you his. I could tell you his his exact number. Shout out yep. to True Media. I can tell you today. Yep. Uh, coverage snaps. So Carlos played 25 snaps. Uh, seven of those were in coverage. So oh about a, gosh. Uh, 
a little less than a third of the time. That is so disrespectful. He had 12 snaps as an actual pass rusher. Oh, man. Uh, yeah. That um, man's been put. Hey, man, you, just, you might as well just see if you can play linebacker at this point. Yeah. And he, well, he is playing linebacker. It's a problem. Uh, and he didn't have a pressure or a quarterback hit or a sack. Um, yeah. Not, not, I feel bad. Using him wrong. They ask, yeah, man, using him wrong. And he's not, it's not like a young guy they're trying to like convert. Man, he's in like year 12 or something. It's like, bro, he's coming I'm off a really good season. The, Damn that. He's been rushing the past for 13 10 years? years. Yeah. <laughs> what are you asking me to cover for? Why are you asking me yeah. to cover Nico Collins in the slot? <laughs> like, what are you talking about? Hey. That's not why you signed me. No, I mean, I feel, but you're right, though. The pass rush is like the one thing that even when in a blowout win, you're still, I mean, even I guess the Jags, they blew them out. And I don't even think they got at Trevor Lawrence that much. I think their sacks were, I can't, I have to look it up, but I'm pretty sure like Ryan Neal had one of them on like a blitz. Like, even that wasn't a, particularly dominant pass rush day and it is really uh, hard for me to like have a lot of faith in a team that cannot consistently rush the passer man that is really and not to come off as nitpicky but that's just one of the things they can improve on and i'm hoping they do so very quickly because it again back to your earlier point it'll quiet the noise quieting the noise equals w's and w's hey you might just get a shot in the postseason who knows but you have to win week by week and not having a pass rush is not the recipe that you want to be successful. Uh, so no. hopefully, yeah, no. hopefully things can, they can get something going. Uh, yeah, I mean, you, can't, you can't win with it. You can't win with a, um, it's going to be really hard to win without a, a pass rush against good teams. You can be some bad teams. Like the Niners, I don't think are a good team. Uh, I don't think the Cardinals, well, the Cardinals are a good team. So who are they, who are they beaten this year? They beat the Colts who are a good team. They Green beat Bay. the Niners twice. I don't think the Niners are a good team. I know they're seven and six, but I don't think the Niners are a good team. Um, who else did they beat? Jaguars, trash. Texans, trash. I'm are you talking about the Seahawks or the Cardinals? No, uh, I'm talking about Seahawks. Are, uh, they beat, they've beaten like teams that aren't very good. And the gotcha. reason that they have to beat teams that aren't very good, I'm missing a win in there. Who else did they beat? They beat the Niners twice, Colts, Texans. Oh, Jags, that's it, five. Yeah, um, so they've beaten one good team in my mind. Uh, so that's really not, you know, enough. And, you know, I, I don't even think it's nitpicky. Pass rushing is very huge. <laughs> you know, they invested in pass rushers. Well, they got Chris, they won the game 30 to the 13. They, come on. You know, that's that's kind of where no, I'm looking fans, at. It. Fans know. They, they know how to put stuff in context. They know how to put <laughs> stuff in like, hey, you got to adjust for your uh, uh, opponent. Uh, I, will, I will add to the positives from this way before we get into Twitter questions is that they – this was probably one of the best games that the offensive line played. And that Russ yeah. played with them. Um, because you know, sometimes Russ takes a sack or something like that. That's not Russ. You know, hold the ball. Russ does this to every once in a while where he'll scramble out and instead of just throwing it away, he'll just take a sack right by the sideline. And it's like, bro, you're messing up your own numbers, right? These like my fresh ready getting hit, just throw it away. Like I'm watching the Packers game, and right Aaron Rodgers just did that. He was right by the sideline, just threw it. He was three yards back. So if he got pushed out of bounds, it would have been a sack. Instead, he just got rid of it. So I think that not not sack, not uh, taking a sack today. That was the first time since the Washington game last year. So I was right about that. Um, so that was week fifteen last year. So basically, went like a whole year um, where he right. had a, he got sacked at least once, whether because of the O line, because of him, or whatever. But I mean, today was up front. I really think. Um, I mean, Rashad Penny even said it rightfully so he's like i don't he's like I, I deserve some praise i don't even know if he said that but he was basically like the old line deserves this more than i do and he's right and that's not just not just because of the run game you know shout out to rashad we'll get to him in the, in the, in the twitter questions but when you have an old line you can run anything you freaking want <laughs> the game the opens up. <laughs> you can run the veer you can run the wishbone what? wildcat you can, run, you can run the wildcat it doesn't really <laughs> triple option when you have run blockers Oh no! Excuse me. When you have just protection in general, whether you're protecting your running backs, or you're protecting your, you know, your quarterback, whatever. If you can block, you can run anything you want. Like I know a lot of people got mad at the um, the toss sweep on third down today by Rashad Penny, like earlier in the game, and it was like, I mean, I guess I get what they were trying to do. They loaded up one side, the strong side of the formation, and tried to catch them on a weak side toss. Like I get the deception there, um, but it's like, why didn't that play work? Because the blocking fell apart. When you can block, every play works, you know? So I think that this was a really good illustration of that. And I think that 
Russ will be excited about a game like this. Yes, now he was letting it fly downfield because that's what he likes to do. And he was doing that even though there was sometimes like an underneath thing. He was like, you know what? DK over there somewhere, you know, and just and just threw it, which I can I can get down with. You know, same thing. Tyler over there somewhere, you know, shout out to Tyler. You know, he had a buck 42 uh, today, I believe. But I, I say that to say Russ is cool with a game like this for all the beefs that he, he and his camp have with the, um, you know, with Pete Carroll and his system and stuff like that, at least reportedly have whatever. If the Seahawks had an O-line. Russ don't care what these what these do. I was about to cuss. Russ don't care what these guys run. They can run whatever as long as they win games. Because when you have O line and your and your front beats their front, you are going to win. Like their front, the Seahawks front today kicked the Texans front's ass. The Seahawks could not run. The Texans could not run the ball. What did their running backs combined for? Fifty five yards on twenty two carries. That is terrible. That's a whole lot of just running into big dudes for Rex. That's why Rex Burkhead got hurt. <laughs> yep. He's out here just running into big dudes all day. And Royce Freeman, too. Um, meanwhile, the other team ran for damn near 200 yards, right? Um, one team was able to protect their quarterback. Russ didn't get sacked. Davis Mills, while he did, he only got sacked twice, he was under some duress. You know, the pressures, the pressures were coming. Um, and there was a few quarterback hits in there, too. So my, my point is, too, beyond thinking that you're right about all stuff in the game, and then, you know, the point I wanted to make is about they really needed to quiet the noise with this win. The, I guess the third section of that is the when you have a front, Pete Carroll doesn't look like a dumbass when it comes to offense. You know, because he had some viral quotes. That, I mean, I tweeted a couple of his quotes. But, like, he subscribes to some bad math. He wants to run it too damn much. He still believes that you need to run it well to do the play action. And it's just like all of these antiquated notions about offense. But you know what? You can overcome all of that when you have when you when you block. You really can't. Um, whether it's you're blocking with D. Eskridge leading the way or <laughs> you're leading, you know, leading with uh, Will Disley, who's an excellent run blocker. Or like Jake Curran, the, the rookie tackle who made his first start. They ran behind that right side the whole freaking, no, excuse me, the whole freaking first half. I guess we can cuss on here. But yeah, the whole first half, they running right behind Jake and uh, um, Gabe Jackson and just running right through the Texans, you know, so because when you can block. You can do whatever the hell you want. And this was, I mean, this is against a really bad team again in the Texans. But if you can do, the good teams can do that against the other good teams. And that's why they're Super Bowl caliber. That's why the Bucks are like that. Or the Rams or the Cardinals or the Packers, you know. And that's why the Bills won't be. It's because they can't run the ball to save their freaking life. You know, it's Josh Allen or bust. So I think that when I I'm gonna watch this game back and I can't wait to do so, well, I can't wait. I'm going to take my ass to sleep when I land tomorrow morning. But uh, when I watch it, I'm just, I bet you I'm going to be so impressed with the line, especially Jake and, you know, even the interior guys. It just looked like, like I know Rashad made some guys miss to uh, get his spring, his big runs. But some of that, like that dude, he stiff armed in that first run. He didn't oh, get the touched after he got the first down. Why? Because he had blocking and then he had D clearing the way. Cause when you block any play can work, um, you know, there was a play, and I know everyone's been critical of it. I think we might have been right after the show. It was the D. Eskridge. Um, I think it was like a jet sweep against the Packers in like the third quarter. And it just kind of felt really predictable. And if you watch the play again, the Packers don't sniff it out. I think it's like Rasul Douglas it just comes in unblocked because Alex Collins misses his block. So it's like you miss a block. Every play looks predictable. <laughs> you know? So yeah. I just think that uh, – Today's game, perhaps more than any in in recent Seahawk years, highlighted the important uh, recent Seahawk games at least has highlighted the importance of Russ and Pete can get along when they block. Maybe that should be the title of the damn show. Is that they don't <laughs> the era don't need to end if these guys can can hold up. And that's just not the O line. That's you know the running backs, the receivers. You know, you know that's the tight ends. Everyone's part of the protection plan and the blocking schemes. But when all that works together, and look here. Then they can beat beat everybody, um, and I say that to say people probably see my tweet um, where I quoted somebody who was like, "Yeah, when we play our best ball, we can beat anybody." That's from Daryl Taylor um, because he really feels that way. He was like, "When the offense is running it like that and throwing it like that, and we stopping to run like we are, we can beat people." And he's not wrong. They don't get Seahawks don't get blown out. When's the last time they got blown out? You blew out last year. Somebody blew out my last year. I'm trying to think. Oh, look it up. It's been a minute, I think. I know they got blown out a couple times in 2019. The Ravens, definitely. That was. Oh, my goodness. 
Yeah. <laughs> Lamar Jackson Maybe. come up here cooking. The, the the Saints, well, he he definitely ran all over him, uh, but he didn't throw for very much. Uh, the Saints smoked him. Um, they turned the ball over a lot in that game. Uh, 2019, they also got blown out by like the, the Rams. 2019 was ugly. They got blown out by a lot of teams. Uh, but in general, what do you consider a blowout, Mike? 13 points or more or what? 17 or more is my. Oh, OK. So not this season. Like I guess said, the Packers game technically would be that since uh, they got they got skunked. But that didn't feel like, you know, what I'm saying that was three. Wasn't nothing a, and fourth. Yeah. You know, and it's. <laughs> I guess Aaron Rodgers' team. Well, my point is, you don't even got to look it up. My, my point is that it's a fun exercise. Yeah, no, no problem. When you can, when you keep your quarterback upright and clear holes for your running backs, I don't give a damn whether Russ is cooking or not, because everybody eats. Ooh, that was fire! I'm about to clip bad, that. Mike. I'm about to clip that and preview that when we tweet the show out, because that was <laughs> that was kind of fire. Like, watch the Texans lose to the Seahawks on a Sunday, and you will see that it does not matter whether Russ is cooking or not. Because when you can block and you can protect, everybody eats. That's real. We should go to well, Twitter questions on that. Yes, everybody eats. And we have a segment where we allow our listeners to eat, and that is with Twitter questions. So we have a bunch. We're going to start off with the Rashad Penny one. You texted me one, so I'm going to ask this first one. And I think it'll tie into the other three or four that we got. But basically, the question is, was this a fluke for Penny or a sign of bigger things coming? And do you think that the Seahawks should consider re-signing him for the cheap? What are you thinking there? Um, that's a good question. I don't think this is a fluke by Rashad. Now, he won't run for 137 yards every week because no one does, right? That's just how the NFL works, unless you're Derrick Henry. Then you might actually run for 137 yards every week because that dude is... He's like an Autobot with cleats on. Like, Derrick Henry is just different, but... I think Rashad, and I made this point in August too. I was really worried about Rashad Penny in August because I, he's not a relief pitcher. You know, for, I know Chris, you don't watch baseball, but I mean, you at least know how that works, right? With the relief yes, pitcher, you know, arms a little yeah. tired, go to the bullpen. Yes, he's not. He's not a bullpen guy. You don't ask him to just come in and just run hard for three times or four times and like, oh yeah, make sure one of those is for forty yards. No, that's not Rashad's game. Rashad is a he's a starter, quote unquote, if he was to be a pitcher. He needs to like fill it out, go through the order once or twice or something like that, you know, and like get cooking. That's where he and they were asking him to just be like, all right, we're gonna run it with Chris Carson a bunch, and when he's tired, then you come in. And it's like maybe you get like eight carries. It's like, no, man, give him double digit carries. Like his games where he has double digit carries, he usually does pretty well. Like he's got this is like his third hundred yard game. And half of the times when he has double digit carries, he uh he he can he has a good yards per carry. He usually cracks an explosive one. I mean, today he only has 16 carries, and that was his career high. 16 was his career high. That is crazy that he's never had 16 carries in a game. You know, for on a run first team, he was their first round pick in 2018, and all the games that Chris Carson has missed. So will he run this way every week? No, because the Texans stink. But I just think that there's something to the fact that a healthy Rashad Penny, who is the starter can actually produce more than what we've seen that is that i'm comfortable saying now to be fair to the seahawks like mike we can't give him a bunch of carries every week because he gets hurt that's fair i went and looked up his injuries today to like track how he had a lot of them he's had a lot knee a couple times hamstrings calves finger like he's, he's he's gone through some stuff so i can understand why he hasn't had a bunch of games with double digit carries when he gets double digit carries he be eating you know, I think the last time, I think he had double-digit carries, I think, against the Niners. But prior to that, he had double-digit carries against, like, the Vikings in 2019. I think he went for 100 yards. Like, when he you just got to let him feel the game out sometimes. Because as you've seen today, he can just pop one out of nowhere. He's got home run speed that none of the other backs have. You know, unless you consider Travis Homer to have that home run speed. So, it's not a, it's not a fluke. He's not going to be a 100-yard rusher every week. But I think that there's, it's definitely fair to say that if Rashad got more opportunities and stayed healthy, he could produce like a, you know, a capable starting back in the league, perhaps, you know, got to stay healthy though. That's the main thing. I'm, I'm hoping he hit the cold tub after the game and that he's good. And I hope he comes back and plays against the Rams. Um, and the final part of that was whether you bring him back on the cheap, I would need to see him stay healthy the rest of the season for that. And then I just don't, it? running backs are just so banged up. You just can't be investing in guys if they're not available. Well, the best ability is availability. 
And then one more, could it be the game that we saw against the Texans, that type of style, could that be enough to propel them into the postseason successfully? I mean, they're not going to play the Texans every week, so no. But uh, if they, if you can run the ball, though, here's the thing. Here's the thing. Um, if I was designing an offense, I would say, my goal would be be really great at a thing and be credible at the other thing. You know, like, I, I don't really care whether I have a run first team or a pass first team. Honestly, I don't, I've, I've become like a guy who's like, doesn't care. But if let's say I was a great throwing team, I don't want to just not be able to run like the Bills. I want to still be able to run just into a credible way to the point where you have to respect my run game. That's where the Seahawks need to get to because Russ and DK and Tyler is so goddamn dynamic. Just respect our run game and we'll be cool. They had to run game not even respectable without Chris Carson. This is the first time it's been respectable in a long time without Chris. I think the last time they had a 100 yard rusher, well, they had a 100 yard rusher that wasn't Chris against the Steelers. It was Alex Collins. Prior to that, the last 100 yard rusher that like wasn't Chris was, I think, might have been Rashad in that 2019 Vikings game that I'm thinking. So they need a credible run threat. If you do that, yes, they can make the playoffs. How would you say the defense did without Jamal Adams on Sunday versus the Texans? Um, okay, this is when I need to watch the film <laughs> right now. Um, I'm trying to see how many snaps Ryan Neal played. Uh, I can't see it right now. But I think I will I will say this. Right, they tried to do a few of the things that Ryan does. Like, I think the first play of the game, he did like a run blitz, you know, and got a TFL of uh, Al Woods or tackle for loss. Um I thought that they um it's it's tough to say initially. I just think that the the way that from what I can tell they adjusted their run defense a little bit, like it was different than it was against the Niners to try to put more on the front seven. That would be my first like inclination. Um I have to go back and watch it. But like they asked Jamal to do a lot in the run game. Like I was I was talking to somebody who's like pretty familiar with the defense, you know, last week and it was like, man, dog. Uh, it was like Jamal losing Jamal's a lot. We were asking him to do a lot of stuff and we were kind of going back and forth talking about all the things they have him doing, you know, where they have him being like a robber and they're cover one. They actually to play man. They actually to play deep, uh, deep single high. They actually to play deep in the two high. They actually to run blitz. They actually to rush the passer. They actually to, you know, stuff the run from the deep safety position. Like they actually to do a lot of stuff. Uh, when you play the Texans, you don't really need Ryan to do all of those things, especially when you're really good up front. But I just thought today's plan was real simple. Like, hey, we're better than these guys in our front seven. So let's treat them like it. Uh, and then if we need to cover, we can cover. You know, everybody covered well today. Like you said, Sydney, uh, DJ Reed, you know, he could, he could cover. Like, it's really hard to complete a deep ball on DJ Reed. You know, you usually have to get an OPI. He's drawn like three of them this year. I'm pretty sure. Like, deep balls usually end up being OPI on, on DJ Reed. Uh, so, or he gets a PBU. You know, Ugo had his best game, I thought. He got his hands on a couple passes today. Uh, so I have to watch it again to really know. But I just thought, like, in general, it looks like they decided, hey, look, Jamal was a very unique run defender from a safety position. We can't ask Ryan to do that. We can have him defend the run, of course, because Ryan ain't no punk. He'll get in there and light some dudes up. But just saw first glance look like they recognize our strength is still within our front guys let's use them and that's probably why a guy like al woods had a big day puna you know even lj had his best day stuff like that speaking of al woods do you happen to know his wingspan uh, al woods i don't know al woods wingspan i've talked about it but i will use this question to talk about how look man i can't remember what game it was i want to say maybe the first niner game it might actually been the titans game i remember tweeting like hey man because i can't hear the broadcast uh, when I'm in the, at the game, I was like, I hope the broadcast is showing Al Woods love because Al Woods be in there messing these centers and these guards all the way up. Like Al be just in there. Just look at the play. He almost got the safety. I can't think. I can't remember if that was a guard or a, or, or, or Justin Britt, the center. I just know he moved that grown ass man out of the way off of the snap. And, you know, that's what a lot of nose tackles do. But like Al is really athletic. Like he can, he, he can jump, he can dive, he can run. He's like, he got a little he, quick twitch. Like he's probably one of the best athletes on the team pound for pound. Like if I had to guess my, my the best athletes on the team pound for pound, probably Puna. Dwayne Brown. Du 
Dwayne, yet yeah, DK, Al. Yeah, those would probably be like my top. You know, Bobby might might be in there, like, cause these guys are just so big and strong and athletic, and Al is just all all that man. Like he's been playing at a really high level. He's been one of their best defenders all year. Like if top three defenders this year on the Seahawks have probably been Quandre, Al, and Bobby. Probably in that order too. Al has been playing at a really really high level, man. Like he played five technique defensive end last week against the Niners and shut them fools down. Uh, like you know, that dude, that dude's a beast, man. Uh, he's got more sacks than some of the dudes they pay in to get sacks, <laughs> which, is, which is pretty crazy. You know, he got more sacks than Jamal. Uh, he's rushing a lot more than Jamal, but yeah, man. Uh, I don't know Al's wingspan, but at 6'4", 330, I even Pete, Pete, Pete Carroll today was like, how old is Al? He was like, dog, he's 34. Like, Damn. 34 years old, stuffing the run, playing a bunch of snaps, rushing the passer too. No, nah, man. That's a good pickup by them. Huge. I know you said you need to watch the film on Jake Curran to figure out his grade for how he did blocking-wise, but would you be okay with him replacing Shell at the right tackle if, indeed, Shell goes, enters free agency after this season? Um, This is a good question. I have to watch the tape, as you said. Uh, but I think that if Jake ends up being promising, because I can, at first glance, I feel like Jake was fine. I mean, no sacks, you know, and no like super bad, you know, reps that I could really see. Um, he didn't look overpowered, overmatched on anything I saw, but I have to watch, you know. Um, but I do, I wouldn't go as far as like, I right, let's let Brandon Shell walk because if nothing else, depth matters, as we're seeing, you know. And I think last year at the right tackle position in particular showed us that depth matters. Like they lost Brandon Shell for a little bit. I think it was ankle. Cedric Bowie came out and played like trash. And then they ended up playing, needing to play like Chad Wheeler over there for a little bit. I don't know if everybody remembers him playing. I know they remember what he did to his girlfriend, but like the right tackle position just last last just last year was a roller coaster when Brandon Shell went out. And Cedric ended up playing well, but I think you, you got Jake for the cheap already. So bring back Brandon. You know, let him compete. If if Jake's better this in September after after camp next year, well then all right, keep Brandon for depth if you can. If not, trade them. You know, like there's there's a lot of value in like a however uh, however old he would be tackled. You know, in this league, so I think they're in a win win if they have Brandon Shell and bring and can bring him back on a reasonable salary, and if they got this Jake Curran kid. Who am I saying his name right? Curran? Curran? You say that boy name. I should call him like that. Curran. Yep. You got this Jake Curran dude for the cheap. I think you keep them both because the only thing better than a good offensive lineman is another good offensive line. So that's this kind of how I look at it. Let's talk some kicking. Jason Myers is roughly kicking above 60% and kicking 50% from 40 plus yards. Is this an area of concern as the season draws to a close? Will this have an impact on Seattle's draft strategy? They shouldn't draft a kicker. because that's They don't have enough draft capital to do that. Um, but yeah, no, I'm worried about Jason, man. Like he misses a lot of PATs. I don't have this stat in front of me. I remember Corbin, Corbin Smith, uh, Sports Illustrated Maven. He was saying in the press box, he was like, Jason like has the record for like most missed PATs or something like that. Maybe among active kickers, I'm not sure. Damn. But it feels like he just he just misses them. And it, when you don't have a margin for error, that one point really matters, man. Like this was a really rare instance where a missed PAT didn't matter, and it was a really 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 rare instance where missing two of them didn't matter. Seahawks games are weird as hell. How often does a, a missed PAT never come back up? It usually does. I mean, he got he got lucky there. And Pete Carroll kind of dismissed my question when I asked about it. And he was like, nah, you know, he's, you know, he's a good kicker. I'll figure it out. Maybe that's what he should say. But I don't know, man. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm a little worried. Here's what I would do if I was the Seahawks. I would, you know, I know they dedicate, I think, Thursday's practice or Friday's practice to a lot of situational stuff. You know, a lot of red zone, um, two minute. I know they do that stuff every day, but. I don't know, carve out three minutes, whatever, five maybe, uh, every day of practice from now on, on two point, two point plays. However long you're working on two point plays, usually add five minutes to it. Use the <laughs> extra five on two point plays and just try them out during the game. You know, let's say you score first, you know, on your first drive, you're up six, nothing. Just try it. It's really inconsequential early in the game. And if you get it, you learn, you get a lot of info, how teams are defending you, what plays work, blah, blah, blah. Um, Cause right now I think they're one for two on two points. 
uh, maybe. They, they lost the Washington one and got the one uh, today. So I, I think that that's what you got to do if Jason's going to continue to not be reliable at a time when you just cannot. Every point matters. I think that's just. I'm, it's not even from a never kick standpoint. It's like, bro, like you said, they have no margin for error. They can't lose. And you know they're going to play these one score games going forward, <laughs> even against the Bears or Lions. Those could be one score games. Uh, don't so say if that. You're, if you're, if your if your kicker can't reliably make PATs, man, then you gotta you you gotta adjust and start going for two. I feel like if the Seahawks make the postseason, Pete stays around. But if the Seahawks miss the postseason, it's likely he's gone. Is this a fair assessment, or is, am I dreaming? And also, how much trouble is the defense in, if any at all? I'll answer the Pete part first because I do think that's important. If they make the playoffs, remember, guys, we're talking about like five percent here. Like they're remember, I said they bought seven days, not seven weeks. <laughs> they're probably still not going to make the playoffs, right? And there's still probably going to be changes made. And even if they make the playoffs, right? And they're the seven seeds somehow, and they have to go to Arizona, you know, or Green Bay or something like that. We kind of can figure out how that would probably go. And if Ru- and if the OC got fired after 12 wins and Russ damn near demanded a trade after 12 wins, I don't think everybody's just safe after nine wins, you know, in a wild card appearance. I just don't think that's enough to keep everyone around. Now, you're right. Whoever asked that question, you don't make the playoffs and heads got to roll. But I just think heads got to roll anyway, because this is a team whose aspirations are just make the playoffs. That's not what these that's where teams like the Raiders are or the Bengals, you know, like I'm trying to get another team, you know, the Falcons, maybe Panthers. No, the Seahawks like win a championship and they're not going to do that this year. So you need to put yourself in position to do that. And that means somebody somebody's probably got to go. Uh, whether that's Pete, whether that's John, whether that's Russ or I don't know. Somebody got to go. Um, but yes, yeah, you're correct. Making the playoffs is like more likely that people stay, but it doesn't guarantee anything, I don't think, because we know how a playoff run is going to go. It would be miraculous for them to win. How many games would that be? Six in a row? Six, yeah. That would including be six this, games including, in a row yeah. to, to, to make the postseason. And they would need some other teams to lose, to lose along the way. I don't know how much help they got today. I'd have to look at some of the uh, other Not scores. much, because they needed the Niners to lose today. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And they probably needed Minnesota to lose on Thursday night uh, as well to Pittsburgh. So... Um, they probably, yeah, it looks like they didn't get a ton of help. So they're not like in a great spot, but I just think that as much as I think making playoffs will make everyone feel a lot better, it doesn't guarantee anyone's job, I don't think. Were the Texans that bad, or did Adrian Peterson possess through some spiritual or scientific means the body of Rashad Penny? Ooh, I'm going to come back to that because I remember the last question also asked about the defense, if the defense is in trouble. Okay. We talked a little bit about the pass rush. And that's my only really concern because I do think like I, we got to give it up to the defense, man. Not only have they been playing pretty solid, I think they're like a top five scoring defense now, depending on how this uh, Packers game goes, I believe. But it's still not over at the time we're recording. Uh, and I think Arizona is in there too, scoring defense. They're like a top 10 run defense and a top five scoring defense, despite the offense being garbage for the better part of like a month and a half. And now they weren't playing like the best offenses in the world in that stretch, but damn it, man, the way they were competing, fighting to the finish while the offense is going three and out, 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 man. And then to keep fighting and not be giving up points and, and be good on third down and be good in the red zone. Yeah, no, I think that the defense, as long as everyone's healthy, uh, healthy ish, because losing Brian Monet seems pretty, that seems inevitable. He already had one bad knee, then he sprained the other one. Uh, that's, yeah. that's, that's that's brutal. Um, so if they stay healthy-ish, I think the defense is actually in a good spot. Um, you said the other question was about... Uh, what did you ask me about? What was that one I just... Came, oh, Adrian Peterson and uh, are the Texans that bad? Yeah, the Texans aren't that bad. They are, they're, I mean, they're really, really, really bad. Uh, they're bad at just, like, almost everything other than getting interceptions. They're, like, one of the top five teams in, like, interceptions. Um through, 13 weeks, 14 weeks or whatever. Um, but I do think with the with like how they ran the ball, that really was, like I talked about earlier, a product of opportunity, man. Just like Carlos Dunlap said last week, more opportunities equal more results. Rashad Penn is the same way, man. Give him the ball, let him get warm, and he can go. 
You know, I think Alex Collins is built different. I think Alex, you can give him like four carries and he might get you 20 yards on them four. Now he didn't today. What did Alex do today? Uh, he had a rough day. Seven carries for, seven carries for 16, which is awful. Uh, but you, we've seen games where Alex will get like four carries and then, yeah, he, oh, Alex had 20 yards on four carries. That's like a good little, you know, popped a couple, made a guy's miss, made a few guys miss. But I think what really happened is the Texans are bad and Rashad benefited today from. You know, a lot of a lot of opportunities, more opportunities than he's used to get. If the Seahawks lose to the Rams and Cardinals in these next few weeks, will Pete's seat start to really heat up? I think it's already warm, man. They were three and eight. Like they've rattled off a couple. Three and eight, dog. He lost at home to Colt McCoy <laughs> with no D hop. The seat got hot right then. Like, you know, had the seat warmers all up on it. Anybody who ever drive a car with heated seats, that was Pete. But just hot. You know, you know, that's that was him. Uh, and that's OK, because his team won two games right after that. Maybe they win a third. Uh, but yeah, if they go, what would that record be um, if they were to lose those two? It's basically going two and two the rest of the way. So that's seven so, and ten. Yeah, I good. think seven, seven and ten gets you to you sit Pete. You sit Pete down. You sit John down. You sit Russell Wilson down for Jody Allen, that is. And you say, hey, look, we figuring this out or somebody's going something has to change and i still think something has to change uh, whether they beat those guys or not i just think that the reasons that they would let's say they go nine and eight the reasons that they went from 12 and four to nine and eight besides russ's finger are problematic and i don't think it's just oh we lost russ for three games or whatever no 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 no. it's deeper than that and jody knows it's deeper than that it's like mike girl follow said it was deeper than that you know, even if he tried to backtrack a little bit of that report. So, yeah, the seat will get warm. But I honestly think it's warm anyway, just because of why, how the Seahawks got to the point where nine and eight is a successful season. Think about that. It's a trash season. But that would be viewed a successful season now. How do we get here? The answer to that, how we got here, is why the seat's going to be warm regardless. If you have to trade one wide receiver this offseason, are you picking DK or Tyler Lockett? I don't want to trade other guy to be very clear but this is the question that we did not create so uh the, the guy i would probably pick is, is dk just because he's going to get me a really high pick um and the way that receivers have kind of been set up in the draft there's just these studs every year man i mean dog if you just only drafted the next dope kid from bama every year if LSU like maybe. Him, maybe. <laughs> yeah the LSU and Bama are making carbon copies of the same dope ass receiver every year. It's the same dude in like a single digit jersey running wide open through the SEC <laughs> every year for like the last like five years from like uh, Amari Cooper to uh, uh, I guess I think Julio's Bama too, but I think he was a little earlier. Uh, yeah, he was like 2010, but like to Jer uh, Jerry Jamar Judy, Shady. I think is a uh, it's Jerry Judy. Uh, a Bama guy, I believe. I, think so. I know, I know Jamar and, Chase is LSU, right? Yeah, and then the uh, Devontae Smith was the kid there now, like Jamison Williams. Uh, what's the other kid? Jalen Waddle, um, Henry Ruggs, you know, <laughs> like I swear they just put dudes. If you just only take the next dude from Bama or LSU, you know, Jamar Chase, um, you know, uh, you know, j people like Jarvis, Odell. I'm trying to think of we're missing the LSU guy too. Where's T. Higgins from? Is he from one of them schools? What about yeah. Jefferson? He's at Justin Liberty Jefferson. Blue. That's the other Justin Jefferson might be a top five receiver today. He's, he's nasty. That kid is disgustingly good. Oh, I think T. Higgins might be Clemson. Uh yeah, he is. Uh Clemson also putting good receivers in the league. <laughs> so yeah. I think there's a world where if you had the like gun to your head, Mike, trade one. I'd trade DK and then I just draft a kid at like pick 15 or whatever. And that kid might be, he might be a stud too, like right off the bat. So yeah, I don't want to trade the guy, very clear. But whoever asked that, I'm doing y'all a favor, answering your question. Your percentage in the Seahawks making it to the postseason after the Niners victory? After the Niners victory? Mm-hmm. Not high. Um, I would say, yeah, probably like 2%, 3%. I'm along for the ride. I'm willing to have fun as long as they're winning. You know, guys want to talk to me if they're winning. You know, everyone's smiling, doubting me. Hey, what up, man? You know, I saw Shane Waldron in the hallway. He's like, ah, what up? You don't do that when they lose. 
you know, I saw Chad, I saw the running backs coach Chad Morton um, in the hallway after the game today. I was like, oh yeah, what up, man? Dap him up. He don't do that when they run for 15 yards. You know, like, no, they ran for like 200. So yeah, it's, it's love. So I hope they win. But let's, I'm just trying to be realistic because I think the Rams and Cardinals, as we're going to see Monday night, uh, at you know, we're recording is Sunday. By Monday night, people are going to see those are those are those are different caliber teams than what the Seahawks are putting out right now. Maybe that maybe the Seahawks put together their best game in the world against the Rams next week. But as currently as as right now it stands. Those two teams are on a different tier. That's why they have a lot more wins. They have better point differentials. Um, so, yeah, I'd probably like 3% or something like that, 4 maybe. I'm glad the Seahawks are winning, but is it good for this team if they don't make the changes that are needed for this team to be a contender in the future? They should have some of these conversations after that Dallas playoff loss, but winning delayed the inevitable. That is this season. Uh, so, never root for your team to lose. That's just stupid. I'd never do that. I would never do that. Like, you don't need the high pick or the first pick or whatever, like, to draft, you know, like, sometimes the star is pick six, you know, sometimes the star is like a Steph Curry, whatever pick he was, you know, like, you don't, you know, Damian Lillard, six pick. I know I'm using the, the NBA, but like, the Jags had the top pick. How'd that go? The Bears, the Bears had like pick 15 or something like that or whatever when took Justin, you know, like. I just don't ever don't ever root for your team to lose. Uh, and also the other part of that is, um, if we're not even talking about draft status, I just think that from what I said earlier, root for the team to win because I think even at nine and eight, no one is safe. Like root for them to give, go nine and eight, make the playoffs and see if they can make a run. And if they fall short, okay, I think heads still roll. You know, so d- yeah, winning is fine. Losing stinks. Never root for your team to lose. Like in this case, I think even if they got to nine and eight, the best situation possible, people still, you know, the changes will still come, I think. So there's no reason to root for anything other than victories right now. Since you brought up a little bit about the draft, I'll get to this question regarding all of that. Do you think taking Pete out of the draft room and letting John do his thing with whoever he wants to help him could be a power sharing compromise, allowing all three, Russ, John Schneider and Pete Carroll to stay around for next season. I think I'm going to write about this at some point, but I do think that's something that like when I try to figure out what's going to happen this off season, a, no one knows, right? Cause no one knows what the hell Jody wants. I can confidently say that I haven't heard anything to suggest anyone knows what she's thinking, how she wants to proceed or anything like that. Like whatever. I don't care if that gets aggregated or what I'm very, very confident in that thus far. The other part is that's a scenario that is kind of out there that, um, you could in theory just sh- strip pete of the personnel power give it to john and then keep everybody and like all right pete's not in charge of that anymore so maybe we'll start drafting better linemen or whatever there's two problems with that theory um one that assumes that russ would still want to stay if john has the power um we he could not like john either you know he could not trust john to build a team around him either that could be true um we don't know the second part of that is Pete took this job almost exclusively because he would have that power. Is he willing to, after 12 years or whatever, give that power up? That seems very, very, very unlikely. So I think those are the two holdups you run into with that scenario, though I I think whoever asked that, if you're not on the wrong track, there are other people who think that that's like a possible ability to you promote John to football president ops or whatever and you just make Pete the coach you know I think Mike Holmgren had a similar situation in 2000 when he went like six and ten maybe and he was like hey dude you can't be the GM no more and then he stayed and you know ended up going to the Super Bowl as one of him as the coach so I think that it's fair to wonder if that's an option but I just think the situation is so unique in that if Russ is still like I don't care if John drafted he sucked too get me out of here that's possible or for Pete to be like over my dead body I run the personnel now, I think those two situations are legitimate hurdles that you'd have to clear for that to you know for just removing Pete's power to be a viable strategy is there a chance Rashad Penny resigns with the Seahawks for cheap and which position group needs the biggest splash upgrade next offseason uh there's definitely a chance um so I, I've talked about Rashad earlier I want to get to that second part um that's a, actually a really good question I really think it's the it's the pass rush like the edge needs to be better you know i think that's where you can get that's where you need to the splash if you're gonna make one uh i think and i think you just need to if you're gonna have this like bare front thing where you run three defensive tackles out there and stuff like that which is fine i'm cool with that 
then you need to get stand up linebackers who do that. You know, more Vaughn Miller, Clay Matthews types and less like Cliff Averill types. You know, if that's what you want to do, because you can get pass rushers who do that. Like Micah Parsons is like that. He's a stand up rusher. You know, he's a beast. He's built for that scheme. You can do that. I just don't think they have the guys doing that now. They got, you know, exactly. Ben Samuel, Garden, and Najee Harris on the goal line and stuff like that. <laughs> you know, so I just think that if you're going to keep this scheme, you overhaul the personnel. You could go back to it more like the scheme they used to run before, like 4-3 type of thing. You could do that. If you do that, then I think the the position that you really want to upgrade still is up. There's the old line. You got to just change the old line. I think they had a good day today, but in general, they just haven't been good. You know, not consistently. So of all the position groups, like we talked about earlier, that's the biggest one. Because if you, if they're good, everybody else in the offense is basically good. If DJ Reed is out and Heslop is out, Jones and Austin will start. But who backs those guys up? Uh, okay, I'll keep this one short because I want to shout out. What's his name? Uh, the starters are DJ, Sydney, and Ugo, right? Those are the three starters. Their backups are John Reed. He backs up Ugo. And then bless Austin and Nigel Warrior back up the other two. I think that's my understanding of it. I'm not a big prayer person, but like, you know, condolences. He's not dead. But like, I definitely just a shout out to Gavin Heslop, man. I felt really bad for him. You know, I didn't watch the uh, replay of him get hurt, but I just felt really bad, man. Everyone tweeting me, telling me his legs broke. It hurts for that young guy, man. Um, but yeah, that's that a depth chart looks. I think DJ Reed's gonna be okay though. Like DJ Reed just came out at the end because like we up thirty or whatever or twenty, so we don't need to put you back in. And you see why his replacement come in, break his leg. So I I, I think DJ should be okay. He's a tough cat in that regard. Um, but yeah, they'd also be just screwed if their starters were like Bless Austin and like Nigel Warrior or Sidney Jones or something. So. Uh, hopefully DJ's okay and hopefully Gavin I think he's staying here having surgery maybe in Houston so if that happens man I hope that goes well because that was that sucked to see man I, I legitimately felt so bad for him uh, watching that why is DK often getting bullied on jump balls when crowded or is it just me often he seems to miss time his jump or gets thrown off by some contact yeah and we talked about that in the preseason that like high pointing passes is the next step for DK and it always it was very clear after watching him for two years yeah two watching for two years it was like oh dude once you start high pointing passes it's a wrap you know i tweeted that after the um he caught that one up for Shaquille griffin against the jags i was like yo if you do that right there boy ain't nobody gonna be able to stop you he just doesn't consistently do that uh and that's fine he's still a great receiver probably like a top 10 guy at this point you know uh maybe you know right outside the top 10 maybe he's really 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 good but that's just one of the things he just doesn't do very consistently and that he can like he did it against Shaq you know he sealed the Eagles victory in the playoffs or the win over the Eagles in the playoffs in 2019 on like a 50 yard heave that he went up and got so he can do it but I'm with the person who asked that I just don't think that that's something that he's repped enough you know with the contested part of it like he does it pregame and goes up and gets in shirtless and all that but I think he's got to start repping that with people draped all over him um because he's built like an aj brown or a julio who can do that you know calvin johnson he's built just like those guys but they had that facet of their game you know even aj at a young age has it you know where he can go up and just moss guys you know, mike evans you know same thing i want to see that from dk and i just I, I don't know maybe it's reps i have to watch all of them to see but that's my first thought is just you just got to rep it more with guys making you uncomfortable it's like how basketball players rep going up and getting pushed you know, to fight through contact. Same thing. Like, I, I think DK's probably got to rep that a little bit more. Because once he gets that in his game, boy, I changed my answer from the other question. You can get Tyler up out of here if DK's going to be high point passes. Why does it always have to be slow starts every game? And it make you think, could the Seahawks lose? I'm going to rebuke the notion of this question respectfully. The Seahawks scored on their first possession. They scored on their second possession. <laughs> then they punt it. And they scored on the third possession. So this was the opposite of a slow. This was like the most normal Seahawks game ever. There was nothing weird. Uh, you know, no like wacky double punts or nothing like that. You know, like you said, there was no turnovers in the game. I don't, yeah, no turnovers. Um, it was just a very normal game. You know, they won by 20. Like, I think we got to be grateful, man. 
to be very grateful this was because it's about to get weird here <laughs> the rest of the season and this was pretty normal they started pretty fast i thought the reason why i felt a little bit slow because the the jaguars had the ball or excuse me the texans had the ball to start the second quarter and had it until the six minute mark i think and like that's a long ass time to have the ball but the seahawks actually started fast like in a in rare fashion i thought do you think that Pete Michael manages the offense a lot or does he just occasionally give input? I think that is the reason last season Schottenheimer called plays from the booth and not the sideline. What do you think there? I don't know about that part with Shotty. Um, I don't think that had to do with Pete's involvement. I don't think so. I don't I haven't heard otherwise, but I do think that he I do think he has a really heavy hand in the offense. And I just it's it's hard for some people to understand because even last year their their run numbers didn't like shoot up after the Buffalo game, but you could even feel it. Like Russ has kind of hinted at it. You know, Shoddy basically got fired over it. Pete even says, like, yeah, I adjusted us some, you know, to make sure we were protecting the ball and running it more. Like, you know, he took some stuff off of Russ's plate after the Buffalo game. Like he did a lot of things that just changed how the offense looked to the point where his OC couldn't be here anymore for whatever reason. So yes, I do think I don't, I don't know if micromanage is the word I want to use, but it's he's very it's Pete's offense. Put it that way. This is a Pete Carroll offense, and it always will be. And that's why I don't just don't think you can just take his power away. He he that's why he's here, for better or for worse. And for for the moment, it's been for better because they've won a lot of games since 2010. So uh, micromanage, I'm not sure, but he's it's definitely a Pete Carroll offense. We got a picture from Paul Martin, P. Martin, Katy, Texas. Could you hear me cheering today? Seriously, 12 outnumbered Texans fans today. How often does that happen? Yeah, that's pretty rare. Shout out to Seahawks fans who traveled. Y'all was in there deep, man. Y'all yeah, was Paul deep and his there. wife are there, it looks like, enjoying yeah, the game. Yeah, no, no, I, I, I saw the picture, yeah. No, shout out to Seahawks fans. Definitely feel like a home game in there for some of them plays, man. The Texans, <laughs> poor, poor Texans fans. Uh but yeah, they traveled really well. I, I think the Seahawks have only traveled that good, I think, to um, uh, Arizona. Seahawks fans travel really well to the Arizona game. The Bay Area, too. Uh, but yeah, Probably because it's really yeah. nice out there. Yeah, it's nice to get away from Seattle, go to the sun. Yeah, it's not that far of a trip. It's not expensive like LA to like actually be in the city. So yeah, shout out to Seahawks fans who made the trip. And our last one, Mike, how was the food down in Houston? Ooh, okay. So I didn't eat that good while I was here this time, but I was in Houston for the bye week. Um, I was not at the Astro World Travis Con- Travis Scott concert, though I was here that weekend. Uh, I ate very good. Like soul food in the South is, oh, man. I could do a whole podcast on that, man. I'm really into catfish right now. So if you give me like some really good crispy ass deep fried catfish with a side of mac and cheese. Don't let there be some sweet potatoes over there. Oh, man. If you're in Houston, there's some fire. A place called Taste is really fire out here. A great name. A place called Lost and Found. Um, a wow. Place called, they, they... It, the names are fire, too. A right? place called man. Phil and Derrick's. Um, it's a little uh, generic, but I feel it. <laughs> yeah. If there's another name of a place that I went to. Um, I went to Lucille's with Greg Bell and Bob Condota and some guys. That was this time that I was here. Uh, so yeah, now so the, the, all the southern f- soul food has been fire. Like that's, I would gain so much freaking weight. I'd look like Al Woods if I lived here for too long, man. <laughs> oh my goodness! Oh, I do eat really good in Houston, man. Like if you get you get a chance to come out to Texas, man, uh, you're gonna eat fantastic. Oh man! And make sure you always take recommendations from your big friends. That's what I always do. All my big friends, I hit them up. Hey, I need food racks. They always know where to go. <laughs> I don't take no recommendations from no no skinny people. Mm-mm, not here. Although you have that. <laughs> take, take it from your big friends. But yeah, well, we, want thank, we want to thank you guys for all the Twitter questions. We appreciate all the love and support. Thank you for subscribing to the YouTube channel. We hit 1K. So that yeah. was awesome. So thank you again for that as well. Mike, is there anything you want to add? I appreciate the love from everybody. Appreciate the questions. As you can see, we kind of scaled back on the midweek episode because the Seahawks have been trash. Um, it'll probably stay the same this week too. Maybe if they beat the Rams, we can we can talk about something uh, after that. But for now, uh, this will be the last time you hear from us until after the Rams game. Um, so make sure tell a friend, tell a friend, tell a friend, subscribe. You know, 
review, rate, all that stuff. You know, they keep coming with the questions after the games. We love you guys. We love the support. Uh, appreciate it. And now, we're out of here. Peace out.